we are now recording. You probably got a little pop-up that said that, but again, so just welcome to everybody. My name is Jamie Vibach, and I am the Will County Director of the Conservation Foundation. That just means I handle all of our activities in and around Will County, Illinois. So if you have a question, please use that Q&A box. That'll let everyone else see your question. It also makes it easier for me to find them all. Questions can somehow get lost in chat with this many people in the room. The messages are flying, so I may or may not see it in time. But if it's in that Q&A box, I will make sure to answer them as best I can at the end of the presentation. Um, for your safety, please don't click on links posted by anyone other than me. There's a whole lot of people in this room. And while I would like to believe everybody's a good person and has good things in mind, um, yeah, you just never know. So, um, you know, if I post it in chat, it's going to be legit. So we are up to 410 people in this room. That is unbelievable. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I am absolutely blown away that we have had an enormous response to these webinars and I just, I can't even believe it. Um, like I said, there were over 800 people who signed up to be a part of this webinar. And I know a lot of people sign up with the intent of watching it later. That's totally cool. Um, but like I said, over 800 people, which is probably about 780 more people than I thought would be interested in what I have to say. So I am super excited here. And we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you. And there we go. So we are going to be talking today about pollinator gardens and creating a pollinator garden in your yard. So let me go ahead and get that started. There we go. That is me. That is my contact information right there. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Um, we're going to talk about our conservation at home program and mainly applies to our service area, which is Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will counties in Illinois. But outside of that, we do have a couple of franchisees. So if you are somewhere else and you're interested in this program, drop me an email and I will get you to the right person. That is my office line that's listed there. I am still working from home at the moment. I do get my voicemails, but email is just kind of the easier way to get a hold of me. So we are the Conservation Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we've been around since 1972. As I mentioned, our headquarters is in Naperville, Illinois, but we work all throughout the Chicago region. And we do this, that's our mission statement right there, is because we want to improve the health of our communities. So we protect natural areas, open space, rivers and watersheds, all of that. It protects our health, the health of our communities and the health of our planet as a whole. We are an accredited land trust, which may not mean a whole lot to everybody, but believe me when I say it's a really big deal. Um, it just means that we have been found to be doing things right with our finances, conduct wise, record keeping, all of that kind of good stuff. So we do the best that we can. We have helped to preserve over 35,000 acres of land in the area through various methods, working with forest preserve districts, municipalities, and all kinds of other organizations. We have 43 conservation easements in seven counties. So you can see, even though, like I said, our core area are those four counties, we do work outside that area when it makes sense to do so. And why do we do it? Well, conserving open space helps to preserve our quality of life, as well as that of our environment, our birds and our butterflies, which we're going to talk about today, all of the other little critters, um, our kids. It helps to um, protect the mental health, physical well-being of us, our children, and our responsibility to future generations to take care of all of that. So right now, even though a lot of us are staying home, staying indoors, there's a lot going on in the world right now, getting outside is good for our mental health. All right, so we have, when we talk about pollinators, we've got a couple of things going on here. So we want to think about host plants and nectaring plants. So host plants are the things that the butterflies are gonna lay their eggs on or the pollinators or whoever. Even I'm gonna talk a lot about butterfly gardens, but it really translates to all pollinators. It's just easier to say butterflies. So 
the host plants is what they're going to lay their eggs on. So in the case of monarch butterflies, which we'll talk more about in a minute, that's milkweed plants. Nectaring plants are what the adults will eat. And usually pollinators are fairly specific on the host plant, so they'll only lay their eggs on one or a couple types of plants. But nectaring plants, there's usually a wider variety of things that they'll eat in those cases. So let's talk for a minute about the butterfly life cycle. First of all, it, they start as an egg. So the mama insect lays the egg and you can see how tiny, it's this little guy right here, hopefully you can see my pointer, right here at the tip of the pencil there. They are tiny, they are about the size of a head of a pin, maybe even a little bit smaller. These are monarch eggs, by the way, um, laid on the underside of a milkweed leaf. So for about two weeks, well, they're an egg for about three days, and then they hatch. Then they are in the caterpillar stage for about two weeks. They go through several developmental stages in what we call instars, um, where they shed their skin and grow and then shed and grow because their skeleton is on the outside of their body. So they have to shed that off so they can grow. But they really spend the next two weeks of their life doing nothing but eating and pooping. So that's it. That is what they do for two whole weeks. They will eat and poop and eat and poop and grow. And then they're going to make their chrysalis. So that is a monarch chrysalis. They are absolutely gorgeous. I feel like they, they look like they were painted. Um, those gold dots, all of that, that is all naturally created. It's amazing. So they make that chrysalis and then they're going to stay in that chrysalis for two weeks. While they're in that chrysalis, scientists have recently learned their bodies basically turn to goo inside there. And then that goo somehow reorganizes itself and turns into our butterfly. So they come out of that cocoon. They call that eclosing as they come out of the cocoon or the chrysalis. And they got to dry their wings. Their wings unfold like some kind of weird origami. And there they are. There's the adult form. And then they're going to stay as that adult form for about another two weeks. So everything happens in kind of a two-week increment there, except in monarchs' cases, that last stage, that last adult stage there, they go into what's called diapause. So there are four or five generations of monarchs that live in our area. And that last generation they call the super generation because it's almost like if you would become a teenager and then stop aging. That's what they do. So rather than dying after two weeks, they go into diapause, which means their development literally stops. And then that's the generation that's going to migrate all the way down to Mexico. So that individual is going to fly itself all the way down to Mexico and it's going to live there for about three months in the Oyamel trees outside of Mexico City. They're going to live in those trees and just kind of hang out there all winter long. And then as things start warming up a little bit, as the weather starts changing, they're going to start their journey back. About the time they hit Texas, that diapause, their, their development kicks into gear again, and they're going to start aging. They're going to lay their eggs, and then they're going to die. And those eggs are going to hatch, go through that whole life cycle again. Those adults are going to continue that migration. So it's the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of the ones who left here that are going to be the ones who make it back in the summer or late spring. So it's crazy. There, there is just so much I could talk for monarchs for hours because they are absolutely fascinating. So other things to think about in your pollinator garden are, in addition to the plants that you have, you want to have dark colored rocks. These rocks are going to soak up the heat and then radiate it back. So in the mornings when it's a little bit chilly, it gives them a place to sit and warm up again. So you also want to have some water for them, but not too deep because we don't want them to drown in there. So having a little shallow dish of water with some sand in it, some rocks for them to rest on, um, that's perfect. That's a great addition to have for your pollinator garden. You also want to have some shelter. Now, Obviously, you don't need anything quite that elaborate for shelter for pollinators, but the idea is have some shelter for them so that if it's raining like it is outside today, they have a place to go and rest and get out of the rain. 
And then you also want to have some nice sunny spots. So those are places where you're going to have your sun loving flowers, um, places they can go again to warm up and go about their pollinator lives. So we're going to talk a lot about native plants and why is that? Why do we, why are we so focused on native plants to your area? Well, it's because it, first of all, it saves you time and money. So native plants are used to the area that they're in. They're used to those conditions. So when, let's take your lawn, for example, when your lawn goes dormant in the summer, because it's gotten to be so dry out, we have to water it, we have to fertilize it to keep it looks, looking nice and to fool it into thinking it's where it's native to. The grass we have in our yard is not actually native here. It's actually, in most cases, it's native to the Middle East, which makes sense if you look at that. Um, the root system is very net-like and thin and shallow. If you're in sand, you need that kind of root system to hold yourself in place. With our native plants, and I'll show you why in a minute, their roots are super deep, which means when it's dry on the surface, they're still able to get moisture from lower down in the ground. So I see that there's a lot of questions and some hands going up and all of that. It's really a lot easier for me to answer questions at the very end. So just know I see your questions, I see your hands raised, and I will do what I can to answer all of them at the very end. All right, so native plants don't need the uh, energy, they don't need the um, fertilizers and the water that we need to do um, to help the more exotic things um, to grow better. Plus, when we plant our native plants, we support the caterpillars and the pollinators and the insects and those things that feed on the native plants. That's their familiar food source. That's their comfort food. So when we plant native plants, that's what they're familiar with. That's what they're used to eating. They see that, they know, yep, this is my food. But when we support those caterpillars, we're also supporting the birds. Birds, especially this time of year, need lots and lots of caterpillars to feed to their baby. Those caterpillars are very nutrient dense. In fact, some I've, I've even seen studies that say they're even more nutrient dense than beef. So those caterpillars are the perfect food for baby birds. So by having those caterpillars and by having those native plants, we now have the caterpillars. The caterpillars are feeding the baby birds. So that's going to bring more birds to our yard, which is going to bring their um, predators into the yard as well. Now, your yard has become a part of the ecosystem instead of being apart from the ecosystem. So we've got a whole food chain going on right here in your yard. And yes, I know we don't like thinking about those birds being food for other things, but everybody's got to eat. So as I mentioned, our native species of plants have these super deep roots. So take a look at that buffalo grass. And I challenge anybody who's not a really good plant person, especially really good grasses person, to really tell the difference between buffalo grass and our normal Kentucky bluegrass or whatever your lawn happens to be planted with. But look at those roots. The bluegrass roots go down about two to three inches, whereas the buffalo grass roots, those are going down two and a half meters. So the prairie drop seed the same way, that's a nice decorative grass. And compared to the perennial fountain grass, most people wouldn't know the difference, except that perennial fountain grass is going to need a lot more work to maintain. Same with using black eyed Susans. Big blue stem, I wouldn't necessarily suggest putting in your front yard necessarily, unless you've got like a little clump of it somewhere decoratively, but um, you know, in a back area along a fence, it looks fantastic. So I've already talked a little bit about monarchs, but I just wanted to show you here. You can see what the monarch caterpillars look like. And then you can also see some of the different types of milkweed that we have that are native here in Illinois. I've heard we have at least, I've heard anywhere from seven to 15 different species of milkweed native to Illinois. It probably depends on the area of the state that you're in. But I have a couple of examples here. So in the lower right, I'm gonna start with that one. That one's called butterfly weed. Butterfly weed is a great milkweed to plant. Very, very striking orange flowers. 
they grow up to be about knee high. So they look really nice in a flower bed because they don't get too big. They've got that big showy cluster of flowers. They're fantastic. In the middle, we have green milkweed, which is a little less common, but again, another type of milkweed there. And in the lower left-hand corner, we have swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed is another nice one. It grows a little bit taller. It grows up maybe about hip height. And it has those clusters of bright purple flowers on them. Again, all of these are um, host plants for monarchs. So monarchs will lay their eggs on these. And even though we do have the insects eating little bits here and there, studies have been done that show native insects, and I'm qualifying this here, native insects will do only about 20% damage to a plant. The point at which most people think that the plant needs to be treated or um, you know, is starting to look bad gets to be more around 50%. So the amount of damage that they're doing is really not that noticeable. And again, you are planting them to be part of the ecosystem. So we want them to be eaten. If they're being eaten, they're doing their job. Okay. And they're still doing their part with the flowers and all of that. Now, Again, notice I said native insects. We're not talking about things like Japanese beetles. Those are highly, highly destructive and are really, they will really do a number on our plants. So again, I'm not talking the non-native things. I'm only talking about the native insects that have their normal predators and all of that going. Now you'll notice in the upper right-hand side, that's common milkweed. That's the one you'll see a lot of times on the side of the road, alongside farm fields. Um, or you know, just growing wild. You can plant that in your backyard. It is a preferred food for the monarchs. Um, they do get a little bit weedy though. So if you're, if you're really talking about landscape, you wanna keep these maybe to the backyard or in some area where um, they will be able to uh, grow up because these guys will get maybe six feet tall. All right, black swallowtails. This is another beautiful large butterfly that we see frequently in this area. Um, as a matter of fact, somebody just sent, texted me a picture the other day of one of these saying, what is this? I've never seen one before. Uh, they are gorgeous, gorgeous butterflies. And they like things that are in the carrot family. So they like things like Queen Anne's lace, um, even though that is kind of a non-native and not it, it, it's pretty weedy. Um, but it is one of the host plants for the black swallowtail. Um, but Zizia or golden alexanders, that's the one that's in the lower left-hand side there. Um, that's another one that they will nest on. If you plant carrots or fennel or dill in your yard, all of those are in the same family. All of those are things that the swallowtails will eat, um, that their caterpillars will eat, and they, that they will lay their eggs on. So, um, Definitely, I have tons of dill growing in my yard. It reseeds itself in, incessantly, um, but I always leave some of it go in the hopes that it will help some black swallowtails. Pearl crescent, this is a cute little butterfly. I love these little guys. Um, and they feed on asters. Their host plant are asters. So asters are great flowers to have in your flower beds too because they are a fall blooming flower. And there's not so much stuff that blooms in the fall. So for things like monarchs that are migrating through, this is a great food source for them in, in the fall. So highly recommend putting uh, some type of aster in your flower bed because not only will you then have flowers blooming later into the fall, you'll also then be feeding these pollinators that are migrating through. So um, sky blue asters, New England asters, all of these are great aster options for your yard. Eastern tiger swallowtail. This is another large one, frequently mistaken for the black swallowtail. Um, they are dimorphic, which means males and females look different. So on the left, in the upper left-hand corner, this is the male and this is the female. This is their caterpillar over here. Funny looking little guys but their host plant are actually trees. We don't normally think of host plants as being trees, but they are. Apples, maple, cherry, all of those are host plants for the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Again, very beautiful butterfly that comes through um, 
you'll see it flying around here. And there are many, many others, of course, but we could be here all day talking about butterflies. I would love to be here all day talking about butterflies, actually, but let's get back to the gardens and other things that you can do. By having a butterfly garden, you're actually creating less area that you have to mow. So once again, going back to that saving you time and money, you can get rid of some of your grass by increasing the size of your gardens. I like to show this example because this was a park district maintained property. There was a bike trail there that came to kind of a fork and they originally just had grass in there. So they would have to bring their mowers out to mow this section every time they mowed, you know, once a week in the summer or whatever. So instead, we convince them, put a tree there, put some flowers there. Now, as people are jogging, riding their bikes, walking by, they're treated to butterflies in there and probably birds and lots of other things instead of just this sterile patch of grass that was doing nothing and costing them time and money to do. Now, I'm not advocating that you go and just rip out your entire lawn and change it all into prairie. We live in the suburbs, at least many of us do, and there are certain things that are going to be expected. So instead of that, you can always just trade out some things in your existing landscaping. So swap out those daylilies for some Coreopsis or Liatris, which is that middle guy there with the big purple flowers. That's Liatris. Um, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous plant to add to your yard. Uh, yarrow in the upper uh, right-hand corner here. Yarrow is a great plant to have in your, in your landscaping. That's another one that pollinators like. Um, uh, indigo, wild indigo down here. This is that uh, butterfly weed and cardinal flower, right? All of these, you know, any, anytime somebody says, oh, native plants, they're all just a bunch of weeds. I don't think these look like weeds. I think these look like actually very attractive flowers and make a great addition to any flower bed. If nothing else, you can start here. Black-eyed Susans, asters, milkweed, oaks, goldenrod. These five genus, these five families of plants actually support three quarters of all the native insects that we have here in the Chicago region. Just these five genus. So if you put in some of these plants, you're supporting a huge number of different species of native pollinators. So black-eyed Susans are very common one we see in lots of plantings, asters, like I said, those milkweeds are great for lots of different things, both for the nectar as well as for being the host plant. Goldenrod, you gotta be a little bit careful in your landscaping. Some of them do get kind of weedy. Um, so just be careful the one that you pick to use. Um, elm leaf, goldenrod's not too bad. Um, but yeah, definitely make sure you don't get the, the more weedy types. Um, and then oaks are native to this area. And we've lost so many of our oak forests. Um, but they support just a huge number of insects. Doug Tallamy, who wrote one of the first books about native landscaping, said he once decided just on a whim, he took a walk around the oak tree in his yard and he counted, I don't remember the exact number, but I, we're going to say it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 different species of insects just on his one oak tree. And then he walked next door to his neighbor's house and walked around his neighbor, had some kind of I, I don't know, maybe some kind of a sugar maple or something that's not necessarily really native to here. Maybe it was a pear tree, um, something like that. Walked around it and found like five. So oak trees, one oak tree supports a huge number of our native pollinators. So these are all ways that you can help to save the pollinators. We hear so much about save the bees, but Honeybees are actually an agricultural animal. They're not native here. So just like pigs or cows or chickens are an agricultural animal, honeybees are as well. But there are three to 4,000 different species of native pollinators, native bees that we have here that are supported the same way. So anytime you're saving the bees, you're supporting all of these guys. So a lot of people are concerned about putting in a pollinator garden because they think, oh, you know, I, I'm allergic to bee stings. I don't want to get stung. I'm afraid of being stung. I have to tell you, you really don't have to worry. Native bees, their stingers, if they even have them, which carpenter bees, like in our um, 
lower left-hand corner there, they don't even have stingers. Um, but if they do, their stingers are like a fish hook. So they have a barb on the end so that when they sting you, as they fly away, it actually rips out part of their abdomen. They are going to die. They know this. They don't want to sting you. They really don't. They have to be, you have to like be stepping on them or really threatening their territory if they're going to sting. What a lot of people get confused with are yellow jackets. Yellow jackets are a type of wasp. Their stingers are more like a hypodermic needle where they can sting over and over and over again and fly away. I swear they fly away laughing. Um, they are, however, carnivores. They're not going after your plants and your pollen and your nectar. They're the ones that are going after the salt, your bologna sandwich, your bag of chips, your can of Coke. That's what these guys want. That's why they tend to be the ones that have more negative interactions with people. It's not the honeybees that are causing the problems or even our native bees. It's those guys. So our conservation at home program is a program where we come out and we'll walk around your yard with you and talk to you about the native plants that you could, either that you already have or areas where you could add some native plants, which plants would be beneficial to add, um, rain gardens, rain barrels, all that kind of stuff. And there's no charge for this program. So we will come out to your yard, walk around with you and talk about all of these different things. Now, maybe you already have a yard full of native plants. If you do, then you can join the program. And then you get that little sign that you see right here. Now, when you do join the program, we do ask for a donation that covers the cost of your sign. It also gives you a year's membership into the Conservation Foundation. So there's a couple of different, well, there's probably many different theories on landscape design. I am not a landscape designer. I know my plants, but I, I'm, not, I'm not artistic. I'm not a designer. So I'm gonna talk about kind of two different schools of thought here that I've noticed that people tend to have. And in the suburban areas, this native but neat tends to be very widely accepted. You've got drifts of plants, that means little clusters together of different native plants in an area, they're mulched in nicely. We've got a nice native tree there in the back. This would be acceptable, I think, to pretty much any homeowners association anywhere. It looks beautiful. You've got lots of colorful flowers. It's weeded nicely. You know, this is, this is kind of controlled chaos. The alternative is more this wild and free. Now, I love this, but it doesn't fly for everybody. Some people were really raised in that, that you know, garden club mindset of needing to have that perfectly manicured yard. And that's fine, you can still have native plants and do that. But if you don't mind a little more chaos, a little less weeding, a little less mulching, you can do something like this. Get all of these plants together. As they fill in, they crowd out the weeds. They take care of that. You know, you may have to weed occasionally, but for the most part, you've got these beautiful collections of plants all growing together in harmony, supporting all these different insects. Um, studies have shown that monarchs prefer um, smaller clusters. So instead of like one massive stand of 50 milkweed plants, they like the little clusters of two or three interspersed with some other things. Why is that? I have no idea. But that's what people tend to notice. So by having these clusters of plants, maybe it's because there's more food for mom in there too. Who knows? But having all of these different species all kind of mixed together makes for this nice community of plants. So this is a library, I believe it's in either Wheaton or Aurora, forgive me, I forget which one. Um, but they did a remodel, they put in this window that looks gorgeous, and they put some chairs in front of the windows and they couldn't figure out why nobody wanted to sit in the chairs. So we said, well, maybe they just don't have anything to look at. So we helped them turn it into this, this lovely pollinator garden, I guarantee you is buzzing with birds and butterflies and all kinds of gorgeous things. Now they can't keep people out of the chairs. There's practically a line for people to sit in the chairs to watch this, you know, the, all the natural scenes here unfolding. I, I guarantee you this draws in a wide variety of pollinators, which draws in the birds. So really just makes for a wonderful, nice, relaxing 
inspiring place to sit. If you are interested in becoming involved with the Conservation Foundation, as I mentioned, we are a nonprofit. We're a membership-based organization. So you can become a member. At the end of this webinar, you will be taken to a what we call our virtual tip jar. If you appreciate this webinar and the other webinars that we've done, I do encourage you to drop us a dime or a few bucks, and you will then become a member. Um, and then be have all of the wonderful membership things available to you. Um, you can also visit our McDonald farm in Naperville or our Dixon Merced farm in Montgomery. Our farm in Naperville is actually a, a working farm. Um, we it's organic. So we have 49 of the 60 acres planted with organic vegetables um, and we run it through a shareholder program. So we feed over 500 families. Um, unfortunately, our shares are all sold out already for this year. So um, if you're that's something you're interested in, um, keep an eye out this winter. We will open the signups for next year again. Um, but we do feed, like I said, about 500 families, spring, summer, and fall. So it's a really great program. Um, I've been a shareholder now for three, three years, I think. Um, and the produce is phenomenal. So, um, and then we also had the Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery, which is a historic farm uh, that our volunteers manage. And they have all kinds of great events there every year. Um, you can also follow us on social media. You'll find out about other webinars that we're doing, as well as all the other wonderful things we've got going on right now. And you can also get your yard certified. So as I mentioned, um, I am the Will County Director. So if you live in Will County, I would be the one to come out and visit with you. Otherwise, if you're somewhere else, let me know and I will get you to the right person. All right, at this point, I can take some questions. So as I mentioned, the Q&A box, that is the easiest place for me to answer questions. So I'm gonna be starting there. All right, so starting with Christopher's question, should I be panicking that none of my milkweed has started to shoot through the ground yet? Prairie swamp, pope, world, butterfly, not yet. No, you should not. It's still pretty early. Um, there are, while there are plants that are starting to grow right now, Milkweed, it, it takes a little while in this area. So um, here in the Chicagoland area, I don't panic yet. It, it really hasn't started coming up. I was just in my rain garden yesterday and I didn't see any of it. And I know there's a ton there. So um, no, nah, it's, it's just still too early. I don't usually start seeing the first monarchs until mm, the end of May, beginning of June. Plus with a couple of the cold snaps that we've had, I wouldn't worry. Um, all right, I have a very deep shade garden due to trees in a large building. What plants can I plant in the shade for pollinators? Ooh, great question. Um, depending on how deep the shade is, um, so something like Joe Pie Weed is a fabulous butterfly. I mean, they call it butterfly magnet because so many butterflies like it. It does need more part shade, part sun though. I did an entire webinar on shade loving plants. So if I could direct you to our YouTube channel, I again, that's something I could go on for another hour about different um, shade loving plants. But, you know, uh, wild geranium, bluebells, those are the early spring guys that are blooming right now that are good for pollinators. Um, phlox is another good one. Um, yeah, there's a bunch. Check out that shade garden one though. That, that will, um, that'll give you some more ideas. Will the slides be available for download? Um, I don't usually have the slides available. Um, I suppose I could say this as a PDF if you send me an email and I can send it to you, um, but the recording will be available on our YouTube channel to watch whenever you'd like. Is there a link for people to make a donation? Yes, at the end of this, um, when I close out this webinar, there will be um, a screen for you to make a donation on. Thank you very much, Krista. Uh, Becky, can I sow wildflower seeds right over the grass in an area I want to become full of wildflowers? Yeah, that's going to depend on the wildflower seeds. I would say you're probably not going to have great results doing that because grass is pretty competitive. Um, I would probably try and pull up the grass first and then sow the seeds directly onto the soil. I think you're going to have a hard time trying to plant them through the grass. Uh, Rick says, I live in Kane County. I have a wooded lot. And most of my trees have vines that seem to be strangling them. Do you happen to know what these are and how to control them? 
and is honeysuckle an invasive species that should be eradicated? Okay, vines, um, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb, no pun intended, and say that yeah, the vines you probably have are either Virginia creeper or poison ivy. If the vines have lots of really like hair-like roots coming off of them, holding onto the tree, that is poison ivy. Please be very careful controlling that. Um, controlling them generally, I would cut them close to the base. Try not to cut your tree, but cut them off close to the base and then you can treat the stump. Yes, I know I'm, I'm advocating for herbicide, but there are sometimes there's just no other way to control it. Same with honeysuckle. Yes, honeysuckle, um, there is one native species to this area, but the vast majority of what you're gonna see is invasive. If you don't treat it, if you can't dig it up, and if you can't treat it, if you just cut it off, it's going to come back angry. There are places on my lot where I've been trying to get rid of honeysuckle, and I found where a big stump was cut. Now, instead of one stump, I have 10. It comes back angry. You have to, and, you, and so I, what I do is very carefully use a disposable paintbrush with Roundup glyphosate and just brush that onto the cut stump. You don't wanna drip it, get it anywhere else, but just brushing a little bit onto the cut stump like that should be enough to take care of it. So um, hopefully that should take care of it for you. Um, do they already know how to fly versus being taught? I'm assuming um, you mean the butterflies here. Yes, it, it's just a natural thing that they learn or that they, that they realize that they can do at some point. Um, I've raised monarchs for several years for educational purposes and they come out of the chrysalis. You know, they're, they're not very good parents. So there's no parents around. There's nobody around to teach them how to do it. So they come out there as their wings are drying, they kind of pump them up a little bit that gets the blood flowing to them. And then they just take off within usually about, I would say two hours or so. Um, do you have recommended videos or references for seeing the inside of a monarch cocoon? Have they caught the good transformation on video? Um, there are lots of videos on YouTube of monarchs closing coming out of the chrysalis. Um, I would just say do a Google search. It's only recently they've been able to do it and they've done it using an MRI machine of all things that they've been able to see inside. It's really cool. Google, I'm sure there's tons of YouTube videos out there on that. Um, do you rec recommend coloring the rocks or naturally dark rocks are enough to radiate the heat? I would do the naturally dark rocks. Um, I don't think I would paint them. I, I feel like the naturally colored rocks would absorb the heat a little bit better. Um, and plus you don't wanna worry about the chemicals and things that might be in the paints. Um, I don't have a lot of rocks, but I use dark brown mulch, which gets warm. That is, that's good as well. Um, basically you just, you want some area where they can warm up. And especially if you're gonna put out water sources for them, that you really wanna have a couple of rocks in there for them to be able to stand on. Um, where do I buy plants? I'm looking for milkweed plants. Uh, great question. So. I'm, I'm going to say right here, do not go to big box stores to buy these plants. Do not, do not, do not. Um, even though they may tell you they don't spray and they probably don't, I guarantee you their supplier does. Um, and I, I, I see it every year on these Monarch Facebook groups that I'm on. People go out and buy plants from Lowe's or Home Depot to feed their Monarch caterpillars. And within hours, their caterpillars are all dead. Um, so you want to look for a native plant nursery specifically. Um, Possibility Place is my favorite just because it's closest one to me and they have fabulous plants. Um, so Possibility Place in Moni is a good place for that. Um, also, if you go online, Prairie Nursery or Prairie Moon Nursery are both good places to go as well. Um, they will do mail order. I know they're out of a lot of things by now, but um, you can always check. Um, also, natural area natives in, I think they're in Naperville, St. Charles, something like that. They also tend to have some. Um, those are the places I can think of off the top of my head. If none of those are close to you, send me an email and let me know where you are and I'll see what I can do. Um, what plants would I use in Lake Zurich? Anything that we talked about today, um, those are all great plants. Um, check out our website as well. On our website, 
we've got some native plant guides. We've got all kinds of great inform other information about uh, native plant gardens, rain gardens, all kinds of things like that. So check our website. There's, there's a lot more information on there. The name of the orange milkweed on the right is simply called butterfly weed, and it grows um, up to about knee high. Um, recommendations for fighting off Japanese beetles that doesn't require seven dust. Well, one thing I've heard of people doing is making what they call trap areas. So planting something that the Japanese beetles love. I know in my yard, they like roses and they like grapevine. So planting that in a far corner of your yard and just kind of let them go to town there. Um, otherwise, um, don't use the Japanese beetle traps. The, the, like the traps that you can go buy, all that will do is bring all the Japanese beetles to your yard. So maybe give it to a neighbor you don't like. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, don't use those traps. They're tricky. Um, the, the other thing you can do is get a cup of soapy water and then just knock them off the leaves into that cup of soapy water um, as you go along. Um, let's see when I answered that one. Um, I'm sorry, I can't list all the flowers in the chat. That would take me a really long time. But if you go to our website, theconservationfoundation.org, you will find uh, lots of things, uh, lots of plants listed in there. Um, our native plant guide is there. If you can't find it, drop me an email and um, I can send you a copy of our native plant guide. Should you remove flower blossoms as they die except for late fall? Um, that's a personal preference. You don't really have to. Uh, there are some plants that'll encourage them to bloom more. I've heard they call it deadheading. Um, deadheading certain things will make them bloom more as, as they go. So it's really sort of a personal preference. Um, okay, what do I mean when I say some of the plants get weedy? What that means is they will propagate themselves and start to expand their area and they may you know, they may get tall, kind of flop over, and just not look as attractive as, as what we're really going for in this. Um, but yeah, in a lot of cases, like goldenrod, certain types of goldenrod spread a lot. So that's, that's what I mean. Um, anything that would deter yellow jackets? Um, not really. Yellow jackets are ground nesters. So it's, it's, again, the, the pollinator gardens themselves aren't what's going to be attracting the yellow jackets. It's, it's just, it's going to be the fact that there's just an open area that has areas for them to be in. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really sure what you can do to deter them per se. Um, no, this, uh, so Kelsey said, is the sign only for those four counties you serve? No, um, any of our franchisee partners that we work with, they have signs as well that you can get a sign from them. So Cook County, for example, the Cook County Forest Preserve District um, is our franchisee for that area. And so they have signs for that area. Um, Kate wants to know, could someone link a website to officially join the Conservation Foundation? Yes. At the end of this webinar, you will be taken to a page um, for donation. If you donate, you will become a member. Dandelions are trying to take over. Now what? Um, again, this is kind of a personal preference sort of thing. I just pull them when I can. I have a lot in my yard, but I'm okay with it. I don't mind. Um, they're good for the bees. My neighbor is a beekeeper and his bees absolutely love my dandelions. I would rather have the bees than try and, you know, treat my yard with all kinds of nasty chemicals and, and get rid of them. So when they get in my flower bed, I just dig them up. Um, what's a good native plant to climb up a fence? Um, if you're looking for like climbing kinds of things, there is a native honeysuckle that is more of a climbing sort of thing. Um, hydrangeas, there's a native hydrangea that's sort of climbing. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, that's, that's all that comes to mind. You know, there's Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper gets a little out of control in my yard. I try to discourage it. Um, but you can also look at 
uh, tall things too to go along your fence. So something like Joe pie weed, big blue stem, um, you know, any, anything like that would be good up along a fence as well. Is phlox a native plant? Yes, there is a woodland phlox that is native. That, that's a really good um, shade loving plant. Do we purchase the plants from you or recommend a place? Um, as I mentioned, Possibility Place, we do not, we just had our, our native plant sale um, last weekend. We did a whole online thing. So um, you don't actually purchase them from us at this point in time, but there are tons of native plant nurseries. Um, Possibility Place, Prairie Moon, Prairie Nursery, um, those, are, those are the top three along with Natural Gardens, or, or natural, I think it's Natural Garden Natives, so, um, is there something you can put in shallow water features to eliminate mosquito larva? Um, yes, there are little mosquito dunks, they call them, little discs that you can put in there for them, um, depending on what kind of water you have. If, you know, if it's something that, that you've got out there for butterflies, I would quite honestly say just don't make it deep enough. Mosquitoes, if it's real shallow, mosquitoes won't be able to use it anyway. Um, but if you're talking something more like a pond that has issues with it, um, you could use the mosquito dunks, but you could also just get like koi fish or quite honestly, I buy quarter goldfish from the pet store and throw them in there. They will eat the mosquito larva. Um, best way to keep down weeds, have more plants. Um, sounds a little flip, but the more your plants grow in, the less weeds will be available. Uh, or the less space will be available to weeds. Um, you know, you can also mulch in between as the plants are filling in, so that can help as well. Um, does Indiana have a similar organization as yours? There are a couple of land trusts in Indiana. Um, the one that springs immediately to mind is the Shirley Trust or Shirley Hines Land Trust. Um, but if they're not in your area, drop me a line and I can find out more for you. Good options for containers. Containers are always tough with native plants because their roots do get so long and, and you've only got so much space in containers. Um, but you know, some of the shorter ones you could probably do um, like the Black Eyed Susans or cone, Purple Cone Flowers. Um, I think those would probably work in there. You might even be able to get away with some of the um, asters, like, like a sky blue aster or something like that as well. Um, Northwest Ohio, I don't know offhand, send me an email and I will find you an answer. How can we get the plants that I mentioned? Um, Prairie Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery are both online mail order. So you can just go online and order from them and they will ship to you. I have an order coming from Prairie Moon shortly that I'm looking forward to. Uh, let's see, answered that. Um, organic fertilizer and weed killer for gardens and grass. So the interesting thing here is whether it's organic or not, when we're talking about things to kill other things, they're generally not selective. In some cases, some of the herbicides are, but you know, fertilizer is fertilizer regardless. Um, compost is going to be your best fertilizer. So um, you know, if you have a compost area in your yard, I'm putting together a composting webinar for next month. So if you know if you can do compost in your yard or if you can get compost from somewhere that's going to be your best option for fertilizer um, and you know weed killers again cut and dig are are your first line of defense always 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 but for things that you can't cut or dig then you got to look at at using the judiciously use the appropriate um, herbicide in the appropriate amount. So um, again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the weed that you're going for. Again, to, to get the appropriate herbicide, you want to make sure you're targeting the correct plant. So I'm, I'm sorry I can't be any more specific than that without knowing specifically what you're going for. But again, as, as far as my yard goes, we're better off just kind of leaving it to go. Um, is the program available in Indiana? Send me an email. I need, I will look into that. Uh, Kane County coordinator um, was 
Trish Beckjord, but she is moving to Pennsylvania. So uh, we are currently hiring for a Kane and Kendall County coordinator. So if you know of anybody, send them our way. Um, in the meantime, however, drop me an email and I can get somebody out to you if you're interested. Um, again, Indiana, drop me an email. Um, submit a garden outside Illinois for certification. Let me know where you live. We may have an organization available. We can try and figure something out. Um, Angela says, I picked up Salvia coreopsis and hostas today. What do I do with them in the winter? Um, I don't know if, you, if you're talking like right now, I'd say you could plant them right now. Um, depending on the salvia, hostas are not native. You just kind of let them go. Um, coreopsis, you can just let go. Salvia, um, depending on what type it is, may or may not even come back. It, that may be an annual. Um, but generally for cleanup, and I didn't mention this and I probably should have, um, leave the leaves. So in the winter, in the fall, leave everything out on the ground, leave the leaves, leave the grasses, leave the stalks. A lot of insects use those to overwinter. So that's how they get through our winters here. For the ones that don't migrate, they may um, lay their eggs inside some of those hollow stalked plants over the winter, or they may make cocoons inside there or a chrysalis. Leave your leaves, leave all of that stuff, and it's really only about this time of year right now that you want to start doing that cleanup because now that the weather's been warm for several days, they've had a chance to mature and come out. And now we can clean up our yard waste. So yay for being lazy. Um, let's see, maybe monarchs prefer small clusters of milkweed because predators be waiting in bigger clusters. That's a great idea, Kathy. It's a thought I've had as well. I don't know that it's been studied, but that could very well be. Um, is clover considered native? Um, may depend on the type of clover. There, there are some things that we would call clover that are actually a different plant. Um, and uh, sorrel is the one I'm thinking of. It kind of looks like clover. Some people might call it clover because it looks cloverish, but it's actually wood sorrel. That one's native. A lot of them are not. Um, they're not a re they're not super invasive though they're not super aggressive they're easy to pull out and you know they cover the ground and and maybe protect it from some other things so um recommendation of learning more about native plants if you're not in illinois um i would check with your local extension office so here in illinois we have um you know the illinois extension that talk you know they talk all about native plants as well as agricultural type things um, you could also maybe check with your local DNR. They might have more information as well. Um, or you may also have a, a local land trust agency. You can look up um, LTA is the land trust association and you can use their website to find whoever your local land trust might be. Um, and, and they may be able to help you with that. Um, can milkweed be planted now or is it too late? Milkweed is interesting. So it needs to go through freeze and thaw cycles. So you're actually supposed to plant milkweed seeds that have not been stratified in the winter. And some people say directly into the snow. Um, if you have some now that you want to plant though, you've got to stratify them. So there, if you look online, there's a whole process you can go through doing that in the refrigerator, um, inside moist paper towels and things like that. Um, that can kind of mimic that cold cycle that they need to break open that seed coat. Um, but I wouldn't just throw your seeds outside right now. They, they will not sprout. They might sprout next spring, but there's probably a better chance they're going to get eaten by some little critter uh, before that happens. Uh, I already have eggs on my baby milkweed. A little worried there won't be enough leaves for them to eat. I, I hear that. I have not seen any milkweeds um, I haven't, well, here, I haven't seen any milkweed starts yet, and I haven't even seen any monarchs, so, um, but I know that's, it's a, it's a problem. Again, I see it on, on our pages all the time with people showing pictures of milkweed plants that are like this tall, and they've got eight eggs all over them. Um, there's not, just not a whole lot you can do about it. They just kind of jump the gun on it. Na nature will take care of itself. 
Um, is it too late to plant, plant these native plants? No, if you have the starts, now is a great time to do it. Um, in fact, now is kind of the perfect time to do it. Um, but if you're trying to start things from seed, it's gonna depend on the plant. As I mentioned, milkweed, it's a little too late to start milkweed now, um, but you, know, you can always stratify it in the fridge and then try it later. Can you successfully transfer common milkweed? You can sure try. Um, I've heard people have mixed luck with it. Because the roots are so deep, you really gotta dig down and get as much of that taproot as you possibly can before um, transplanting it. So good luck. Uh, let's see, answer that. Comment about black wasps. Are they desirable or a problem? Um, Unfortunately, the issue with common names is I'm not sure what you mean by black wasps. So there's, there's a pretty good chance that they are native and they're a perfectly natural, normal part of the ecosystem. Um, I know there's one called a cicada killer that is big and very black. It's, it's basically harmless to us, uh, you know, pretty terrifying if you're a cicada, but basically harmless to us. So, um, you know, probably not necessarily desirable if you're afraid of that kind of thing, but they're not really a problem. Uh, when should we put out our pollinator garden plants? When is it too late? Um, I don't want to say it's never too late. If you've got things, if you've got starts of plants, you know, seeds, you got to be a little more fussy with the timing of it. But um, if you've got starts of the plants, it, you know, as long as the weather's decent, plant them. Um, you know, I would say it's only too late when it starts getting super cold. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't, late fall, I wouldn't tr necessarily try unless that particular plant wants that. Plants are so fussy. They've got so many different things. Um, plant now, plant two months from now. Um, it, you know, try it out. What's the worst that could happen? You know, you're out, you lose your plant, but you can try again. Uh, my soil is peat rich. What plants work best in that? Oh, that's a good question, Chris. Um, there's a lot of things. Pretty much anything is going to work well in that, I think. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not as familiar with peaty soils, so it's hard for me to say. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, list of contacts for Winnebago County. Send me an email. I will get you. I will get you what I can. Um, in zone five in Wisconsin, are the plants you mentioned viable for me? Many of them are. Um, fortunately, we are basically similar zones. Um, you know, your things are going to maybe sprout a little bit later than ours. Um, but I think depending on where in the state you are, most, most of this is good. Um, you know, you probably also have access to other things like lupins that are awesome. And I wish we could get to grow down here. I've never had very good luck with them here though. Um, but yeah, and you know, you're going to have some other plants that we can't grow down here too, but most of what I mentioned are pretty easy to grow and will grow pretty much across the Midwest. Do you need to protect butterflies from the wind? Our sub has a garden along the road where they're trying to attract pollinators. No, you really don't. They, they will protect themselves. Um, you know, you see everybody with their, those butterfly houses, they're absolutely adorable. They look great in a garden. I gotta be honest, I've never seen a butterfly use one. Um, I would say wasps and spiders are more likely to use them than anything, which is not what you want to be attracting butterflies to anyway. So, um, you know, if you wanna put a butterfly house in your yard, it's gonna look pretty. It's really not gonna attract anything. But, you know, as far as wind goes, they'll, they'll find their own shelter. They're pretty good at that. Is echinacea a native? Echinacea is another name for purple coneflower that is absolutely native to this area. It's a fantastic plant and really great for butterflies. Uh, LaSalle County. We actually don't have a director for LaSalle County because that's not part of our core service area. Doesn't mean we may not have somebody that can help you out though. Send me an email and I will let you know. Um, native sedums. That's a really good question. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure of any sedums
um, sorry, I froze there for a minute. Um, that's not to say that they're not good or that, you know, that there's a problem with planting them, but um, I'm not sure that, that any of them are actually native. Um, and yes, they do grow in sun. Um, okay, last year I spent over $100 at the Will County Native Plant Sale, my favorite plant sale, to feed the rabbits in my yard. Yeah, that's unfortunate. The only thing they didn't eat was the milkweed. Any suggestions to keep the rabbits away to allow the plants to grow? Um, you can put in a small fence, um, just even like a small wire fence around things that will help. You know, the thing about rabbits is depending on where you live, they, it's like they have different taste preferences. I've, I've heard people say, oh yeah, the rabbits just went to town, ate my coreopsis down to nothing. And other places say, oh, they ate everything but my coreopsis. So it's hard to know what, you know, what their particular taste preference is. So um, I would say a little fence. I have heard you can buy like jars of coyote urine or something like that, but you have to reapply it pretty frequently, especially if it rains. Um, yeah, that's, that's the best that I can offer for that. Um, do we have bat pollinators? Um, most of the bats that we have around here are more insectivores. Um, so, you know, in that case, what can we do for them? Not treat your yard for mosquitoes. That's the best thing you can do for bats is not, not kill insects because that's their food source. Uh, let's see, answered that one. Tips for getting a handle on invasive weeds like garlic mustard so they don't crowd out my native plants. Pull, pull, pull. That's the best thing I can say for that. Um, just, yeah, pull, pull, pull. And when you do pull, you cannot compost garlic mustard. You have to bag it and throw it away. Just pull, garlic mustard is this insidious plant that does all kinds of crazy things to help itself to survive. And one of the things that it does is even if you pull it, the seeds will still mature. It'll force all the energy it has left in it to make those seeds mature. So you can't compost it. Don't just leave it on the ground, bag it up and put it in the trash. But yeah, that's, that's honestly the best thing you can do unless you're gonna spray the area to kill off everything and then restart, which you know obviously we prefer you not do, but um, yeah, pull, pull, pull. Um, way to have a garden that blooms for most of the year to feed pollinators. Absolutely, look at the bloom times of your plants. So as I mentioned, fall is great for asters. So plant your asters um, as at, for your fall blooming things. There's plenty of things that bloom in the early spring, um, things like celandine poppy, wild geranium, um, Virginia bluebells, May apples, all these things bloom early in the spring. And then there's plenty of things that bloom also throughout the summer. So yeah, you absolutely can have things blooming all year long. You just have to look at the approximate bloom times for things. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about where to buy plants that haven't been treated with insecticide. Really the best thing you can do is buy from the grower and ask them if they treat their plants, what they treat their plants with. Um, I would say there really is no specific term that you can watch out for because there really just isn't, um, nothing reliable anyway. Uh, where do you get native plants from? Okay, we talked about that. Um, you can either start them from seed or you can buy them as plugs, it depends. Um, it, it depends on your preference and you know when you buy plugs, they're a little bit more expensive, but they get going faster. If you buy them from seed, the seed is cheaper, but it takes longer to get them looking good. So um, do bulb plants like tulips, daffodils, et cetera, help? Um, I love my bulb garden, but is it helping in the spring? Sure. Um, there are insects that will use those things like tulips and daffodils. I've got them in my yard too. They're pretty. They're you know the first things that come up. Crocus are another really nice one. Um, bees love the crocus. So yeah, they, they all do their part to help. Obviously, the more native things that you have in there and that you can get going, the more variety of insects are going to help, but every little bit helps. Um, oh, a resource that details the size and sun requirements for the plants that we recommended. Um, if you, I'm, I'm going to plug Possibility Place again here. They have a fantastic website. If you go on their website, they have a plant finder. You can enter in 
your criteria for your yard, like if it's sun or part shade, how tall you want the plant to get, um, and then it'll give you a list of those plants. And when you look at each of those, um, those plants, they'll also tell you when they bloom, how big they get, all of that kind of thing too. So that's a really good resource as well. Um, we also have our yellow brochure um, that you should be able to find on our website. Uh, it's called Bringing Nature Home, and it's all about native plants. And we'll show you, um, all, it, they're divided out by how tall the plants get. Um, let's see. TCF folks who come to Northern Cook County, again, our franchisee in Cook County is the Forest Preserve District. So um, if you drop me a line, I can get you in touch with the right person. Are hostives native to the area? No, they are not. Um, you know, it's a fine plant. I guess they don't really do a whole lot. They don't spread really, but eh, they're just kind of, they're not my favorite plant. I find them to be kind of boring. Um, is there a reason most wildflower seed mixes advise throwing the seeds on the ground instead of burying them? Really, most of the wildflower seeds, as they reseed themselves, they just kind of drop their seeds to the ground. So generally, you know, especially when we're working with kids and things, we tell them to, you drop the seeds on the ground and then like do a little dance on them. You know, you really just want a real thin layer of soil covering the top of them. You don't want to bury them too deep or they're not going to be able to get out. Um, are native plants in Michigan similar to those in Illinois? Many of them will be. Um, I, I'm not super, I gotta be honest, I'm not super familiar with Michigan plants, but a lot of what I mentioned is native across most of the Midwest. So um, check with your local extension office or DNR or land trust. Um, there's plenty of information out there. Um, I'm, I'm sure for Michigan, I know I've seen it out there, if, even if I, I don't know specifically. What do you need to make the amazing butterfly garden? Well, as we mentioned, we want something for them to warm themselves up on. So like some rocks, you want a dish of water with rocks or sand or something in it so that they're not gonna drown. And then you need uh, lots of flowering plants for them to enjoy. Um, is this a good time to plant wildflower seeds in soil? Once again, it depends on the plants. Some, yes, this is a good time to plant. Others, it's not gonna work. So it really all depends on, on what you're planting and wherever you're buying your seeds from, they should have planting instructions for you in there. Um, would a person from a county extension office be willing to come to our home and give advice on how to landscape a small area with natives? That's gonna depend on your extension office. Some will, some won't. Um, I know Will County will not, Cook County, um, I believe the, their extension, their like master gardeners help out the forest preserve district in doing that. So um, it's, it's all going to depend on your extension office. Um, I planted milkweed by seed. Will they get big enough this year to put in the garden? If you started your seeds and they're, and they're you know, starting already, yes, they absolutely will. Uh, let's see, did that. Same herbicide suggestion for buckthorn, I assume, just as invasive self, yes. Um, yeah, buckthorn is same herbicide suggestion. Cut it and then treat the stump of it, except um, instead of using glyphosate, you want something called triclopyr. Triclopyr is more effective against buckthorn um, than glyphosate is. And it's usually in most of the brush guard um, or brush killer herbicides that you'll see. Uh, let's see, I did that one. Same for killing off vinca. Boy, yeah, vinca is terrible. Vinca is highly, highly invasive, and I don't recommend anybody plant vinca ever because it just, it gets loose, it gets into the forest preserve, it, it gets everywhere. Um, yeah, just pull, pull, pull. That is one you may have to treat with some herbicide to, to kill off the roots to really get rid of it. So best of luck, my friend. Um, wet areas, again, I have a whole webinar on wet areas. Rain gardens are awesome. Look up rain gardens, check out our website for the rain garden section. There are tons of native plants that are listed for wet areas. But that's kind of the key you're looking for is rain garden plants. Um, hummingbird moths, hummingbird moths are awesome. They are huge. Um, yeah, if you see a really big, almost looks like a hummingbird, 
but it looks also kind of like a moth, that's a hummingbird moth. They're awesome. Um, good plants to attract hummingbird moths. Um, I believe they like cardinal flower, joe pie weed, uh, possibly zizia or golden alexanders. Uh, off the top of my head, those are good ones. Um, basically any pollinator friendly um, and especially ones that have the long tube shaped flowers. Um, I read that home raised caged monarchs don't have the radar necessary to get to, uh, to Mexico, true or false? Oh boy, you have hit on a doozy. We don't know is the answer. Um, there was a study that came out that showed supposedly monarchs didn't have the right radar. People who, who have read the study, who understand how the scientific method works and all that, notice some pretty glaring errors in that study. So I, I'd say the jury is still out on that. So um, the, just the fact that monarchs that have been tagged through citizen science programs have been found in Mexico would tell me that that's maybe not the case or not completely 100% the case. So yeah, I'm not sure. The, the jury is still out on that one. When we talk about natives, does that include hybridized varieties? Great question, Lynn. Um, so we call those native Rs. So what those are gonna be is when you buy a plant, it's gonna say something like butterfly weed and then have some cutesy name in parentheses like ice ballet or whatever. Uh, you mentioned Cheyenne spirit. So they have sometimes bigger blooms, different colors, double flowers, whatever. They're not as good. Um, Preliminary studies that I've seen show that pollinators do not use them as much as they use the wild types. And that's, that's the term you want to look for is wild type. So wild type is in almost every case better than the native R's, the cultivars of the native plants. But given the choice of are you going to put in a native R or put in something completely exotic, I'd go for the native R. But wild type is really almost always going to be better. There, they, the studies have found there are some that are still okay that don't seem to matter, but I always I think of it as a lock and a key. So the flower is the lock and the pollinator's mouth parts are the key. And if you change the lock too much, that key is no longer going to fit. So whether you're changing the colors so that, you know, insects can see colors that we can't see, you change those colors. Now, all of a sudden, this looks like a completely foreign thing to that insect. So yeah, so I would try and stay away from native ours if you can. Look, always look for the wild type. Um, do you need to cut back milkweed to prevent types of diseases routinely? No, not necessarily. I mean, not unless you're actually seeing disease on there. There are some things like milkweed yellows that, um, you know, if you see that, you actually might as well just dig them up and re start someplace else because it's a disease that actually gets into the soil. Um, but, you know, if you're seeing aphids, snip off the top. Um, you know, that is an option for, for getting rid of aphids if you're having trouble with that. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know about routinely. Cutting it back early while it's growing will help to keep it a little bit shorter if you're concerned about it, you know, getting six feet tall and going kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say you have to, you have to do it regularly. Um, plants that attract butterflies attract hummingbirds. Many of them do. Um, especially if they have those long tube shaped flowers on them. Uh, salvia is the classic example, even though it's not necessarily native um, or trumpet vine. Cardinal flower is a native that's bright red. That um, That's a really good one. Um, yeah. Can I plant bare root milkweed now? Do I have to wait for them to sprout before I transfer them? Um, yeah, you can. I, I, yeah, I don't see why not. The, the roots are the important part. So I would say, yeah, you could plant that now. Uh, the soil should be warm enough. Um, so we could have two to three generations of monarchs in the summer before the super generation. I think we actually have three to four. And it's, it's that it's either four or five that migrates to Mexico. It's the numbers escaping me right now. But yeah, we actually have several generations that live here, go through their normal thing before we have that super generation. Um, do you cut the common milkweed back before winter? No, as I mentioned, leaving those stalks up are really good for the other pollinators that overwinter here. I leave everything alone until spring. 
Um, does butterfly weed come up from seed or from the root? I believe the answer to that is both. Um, that it will re-sprout and, and, and grow more of itself, kind of spread from the roots, but it does also seed itself as well. So um, yeah, it, if, if you're asking more, is it, a, is it an annual or a perennial? It is a perennial, but it obviously can also start itself from seed as well. Um, I removed my red dogwood shrubs last year to replant with something different. I'm finding what looks like raspberry vines sprouting up in the bare area. I've not planted any. Are these volunteers from birds? Yep. Welcome to the problem with raspberries. Yes, birds and other animals will eat them, poop out the seeds. Now the seed has been planted with its own little bit of fertilizer. Yeah. Um, anywhere, honestly, anywhere you've got trees, you're probably going to find some things popping up. Um, I've got mulberries, raspberries, all kinds of stuff like that popping up in my yard that I did not plant. And it's all thanks to those birds. Um, do you have to clean out the water source? Yeah, it's a good idea to periodically clean it out. Um, you know, make sure any bacteria and things in there um, aren't persisting. So yeah. Uh, the growing place in Aurora, that's a, that is a good place. Uh, that's another one I was not able to think of. But yeah, the growing place in Aurora, that's a good place to get native plants from too. Um, okay. Plant sources, we discussed master gardener chapters. Definitely talk to your master gardener chapters. Um, you know, a lot of them know things like that too. Um, some of the seeds available from share the seed programs like Downers Grove Library. I don't know. I'm not that familiar with them. Um, I would check with them. Um, I was told by someone at a small plant store that proven winners are bee and butterfly friendly, but I'm still suspicious. You are right to be. Um, are there any plant brands that are safe for pollinators? Not that I'm aware of, quite honestly. People want to buy plants that look nice and that aren't full of holes. So all of the growers that I am aware of all spray. Um, you know, you can always contact the companies and ask them directly. I, I've heard people get mixed reviews or mixed answers from companies like that. So, you know, the only thing you can do is ask. Uh, we have a huge amount of standing water in our backyard, basically a natural pond. It dries up usually around August or September. Are there any particular plants that would give our pond a nice touch and how would you plant them? Um, again, I have a whole webinar on planting in wet and shady areas check that out on our YouTube channel. That is, I, again, this, it would take me a really long time and I'm looking at 69 more questions open here. So, um, but yeah, or send me an email too and I can direct you to um, some more resources for that. What is a rain garden? A rain garden is an area with a natural depression in the ground that where you're encouraging water to collect there, but then you plant water loving plants that are there. So it, it's really a good idea for anywhere you've got a wet, muddy spot in your yard, maybe the grass won't grow. And it, it's a way to basically turn that into a garden while also solving that issue in your yard of that wet, muddy spot. Um, we've got plenty of resources on our website for that. I just planted wildflower seeds inside. Will they germinate and be ready to plant in time? Probably, um, you know, as, as as long as they didn't need to be cold stratified, again, there's a, there's a good chance that you'll be able to plant those this year. Um, I have a school monarch garden with host plants for several butterfly species, nectar plants near St. Louis. I rarely see monarchs in my area before midsummer. Should I, should I concentrate on fall host and nectar plants? I wouldn't say concentrate, you know, by pollinators, we don't just mean the butterflies. So there are probably plenty of other native insects that are using those areas. Um, and the thing with butterflies is sometimes it just takes them a little while to find it. So I would keep doing what you're doing, Carla. And I, I think it sounds like you're doing great. Can you plant natives in pots? Yeah, as I mentioned, I, it's, it's really hard to put natives in pots. I haven't heard of too many people having a lot of luck with it. Um, does milky spore help with Japanese beetles or is that a bad idea? Um, I haven't really read up 
a lot on Milky Spore. I know some people have used it to help control for things like that, but I'm not sure what it does to the beneficial insects. Generally, as we say, things that are made to kill, whether they're organic, natural, or synthesized in a lab, they're made to kill. So I, I haven't read up enough to be able to say yes or no on that one. Um, aphids attacking milkweed. Yeah, everybody's got that problem. It's, it, it happens. Um, ladybugs will eat them. Lacewings will eat them. So yay, ladybugs. Uh, the really the best thing I've heard is just you know use your fingers kind of squish them if you if you don't like what they're doing um, just you know kind of use your fingers to squish them wipe them down I've heard of people like using a hose to kind of spray them down too just make sure that there's no you know no good stuff on there um, when you do that Let's see, answered that one Virginia bluebells when can you cut them back after they've bloomed um, yeah you can. Um, yeah, you can, if, you know, if you don't like the greenery that's up afterwards, yeah, you can totally do that. Um, yellow jackets will be deterred by a false wasp nest. Um, maybe certain types of wasps are territorial. And if they see a nest there, we'll go someplace else. Yellow jackets are ground nesters though. So putting up one of those big fake paper wasp nests, may or may not do anything to, um, for yellow jackets. I haven't experimented with that myself, but that's my knowledge of them. Ye yellow jackets love the chipmunk tunnels. Yeah, I bet they do. Um, recommend plant seeds or do both. My parents have a prairie they built over many years by collecting and transplanting. So either way is great. However you want to bring native plants into your yard, do that. Um, the difference is seeds will take a little bit longer to get going and to get looking nice, but they're cheaper. Plugs can be a little more expensive unless you're getting free handouts from friends and family and whatever, um, but they'll get going faster and the area will look nicer sooner. Um, maybe do a mix, you know, make your money stretch uh, that way, you know, whichever. Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, can I plant natives on a hill near a road in an area I will not be able to water? Sure. Um, a lot's going to depend on how wet the area is. Sedges are good for that. There's um, several other types of native grasses that you could do as well. Uh, wild violets, I love them. Um, they're beautiful, they're native, and you know they add a little bit of color to the boring green thing I call my lawn. So yeah, love wild violets. Uh, let's see, answered that one. Clover. I don't worry about clover. Again, I think grass is boring. This is me personally. I'm sure homeowners associations have something completely different to say, but this is me. I love clover. I, my yard is full of clover. My yard has dandelions and my yard has violets and I don't really care because I think it's better than, you know, a dead green stretch. Um, Southern Indiana, I'm not entirely certain. Send me an email and I can look that up for you. Native plants in this area should be fairly similar to ours, but check with your extension as well. Um, yes, lawn treatments. Uh, Debbie says, food for thought. Lawn treatments also kill insects, fireflies, et cetera, that birds feed on. Absolutely. Don't treat your lawn with stuff. All that, you know, true green and chem lawn and all that is really terrible for our insect populations. Um, and it's, it's, it's really very silly to be planting all these things to bring pollinators to your yard only to then go and kill all of their young as they're, um, because that's what grubs are. So, you know, spraying your yard for stuff for mosquitoes and ticks and all that kills everything else as well. I have a wet corner of our yard. I suggest you plant a rain garden there. So Gail, check out our website, um, look up our information on rain gardens. Um, Acres Land Trust in Indiana too. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, anything to deter deer from eating hostas and lilies? Um, a fence, um, although it's, you know, even fences, deer can often go around. Again, I've heard that coyote urine, sp um, spreading that around might help. I've had mixed results with it. How shallow is too shallow for mosquitoes? Um, I gotta be honest, I'm not entirely certain. Um, but you know, anything that periodically dries up is good. So if it dries up, that kills all the, their young. So anything, let it periodically dry out if you can. Um, 
Dolly says Liatris will grow in a container. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Scarlet wants to do a seed exchange. She has some common milkweed seeds. Very nice. Um, just if you are part of our Conservation at Home program, we do have a Facebook page for Conservation at Home members. Um, and that's even if you're not certified yet, even if you just had a visit, you can still join that group. And it's a great group of people who are experienced gardeners answering questions. Hey, what is this? They're phenomenal. And then there's the occasional seed swap and things like that on there too. Um, one is focusing on permaculture and native plants. What would one consider as weeds? Yeah, great. You know, that's, that's a great question, Denise. Um, it, it, it's personal preference. So a weed is a plant that's growing where you don't want it. That is the botanical definition of weed. So if you want it there, it's not a weed. If it is a prize winning rose bush and it's growing somewhere you don't want it, it's a weed. So botanically speaking, there's no such thing. So if you want it in your yard, it is not a weed. Um, what time of year do you use compost on lawns? Uh, as you've probably gathered, I am not the lawn expert. Um, I think spring is probably the best time to do it, but um, I, I would need to read up more on that. Is it harmful to leave lilies along with native plants? No. Um, you know, mix your natives with your non-native stuff. That's fine. Um, Joey wants to know anything for Champaign County. Um, not necessarily, but we do have somebody in our office who kind of deals with the rest of the state. So um, in areas where we don't have franchisees. So send me an email, I'll pass you along. Um, Virginia creeper, what are the issues with it? So Virginia creeper is one of those things. Some people love it, some people hate it. I, in, in my yard, it tends to be pretty aggressive and I find it growing in all these places, growing up my trees, kind of strangling my trees find it all, all over the place in places that I don't want it and can't get to it. I know places like Possibility Place also sell it as a native vine. Okay, fine. Um, again, it, all, it just all depends on your situation. Um, to get certified, does someone come out to your yard or you just answer questions? No, we come out to your yard generally. So um, unlike something like the um, Monarch Habitat certifications that you can get, we do yard visits and so we want we want to talk with the homeowner we want to see what you've got make recommendations make sure you're doing things the right way so you know we do, we do like to have that face-to-face -face kind of thing so if you're in an area where we can't do that we might be able to work something out but send me an email um kankakee county we don't have anybody quite there yet but as i said send me an email i'll find someone to get to you is there a native hosta no not that i know of um, how do you control natives from taking over? There are some natives that are more aggressive than others. So some you need to be more careful with. So pulling is completely legit. Um, you know, if, if, even if it's native and it's going someplace that's not supposed to go that you don't want it, well, that makes it a weed. So pull it. Um, you can plant other things that might help to compete with it to you know give it some competition so that it doesn't get too out of control or crazy um that's or just plant things that don't get out of control and crazy that you know that's the other thing and a lot depends on the area i've had people tell me virginia water leaf just you know gets hugely aggressive and takes over everything i've got a small spot of it in my yard that's been a small spot of it for six years and it's never done anything so i leave it because i like it um and it's it's behaved in that section so don't be afraid to pull things out if they're not working um the little purple violets those are the wild violets we talked about earlier love them they're wonderful uh wild ones is another great organization yep they've got all kinds of good information too um living near milwaukee send me an email i will look into it um all right let's see zone five yeah we're in i believe we're zone five too so the plants that I mentioned should be fine for you. Um, let's see, is Columbine native? Yes, there is, a, there is a native Columbine. I think there might be some non-native ones too, but there is definitely a native Columbine. It's gorgeous. It gets a little aggressive. I planted it in one spot in my yard and it's now popping up in two or three other spots, but I'm okay with where it's going. So it stays. Um, I've noticed monarchs don't seem to like our butterfly weed, but do like milkweed. Is there a reason for this? 
just like anything else, they do have preferences. Um, common milkweed, I have found to be a favorite. Buffalo, uh, buffalo, butterfly weed is another one that they will use, but they, have, they may prefer other things more. Um, so, which native come back each year? Uh, most, so that's the thing with native plants, most native plants are perennial. So they're gonna come back year after year. Um, some will reseed themselves. So echinacea or purple coneflower, that's one that will reseed itself. So if it's not coming back, maybe it wasn't happy enough or something happened to the seeds or whatever, but um, it, yeah, it's, it's a long list. And, and so for me to, I, I can't really go through the whole list but just know that most natives are going to come back year after year. Um, are you able to plant milkweed inside? Yeah, you can start it inside. I, I'm not sure you're gonna get it to be able to grow for very long. Um, like if you just wanted to keep it as a house plant or something, but um, yeah, uh, Lake County. Uh, again, I've got somebody in the office who will talk to you, send me an email. Um, bug hotels. Um, you know, I've heard mixed comments about the bug hotels. So I have one in my garden and the insects seem to use it. They do say you need to clean them out. Uh, the downside is I have read that they can basically become a smorgasbord for things that eat those insects. So by having them all together in one area, as we have all learned is not always the best thing. You know, you can spread diseases and it, also makes for you know good hunting grounds for things that would eat these bugs. So I don't know. I've heard kind of mixed mixed results on them. Um, I purchased mine, but it's basically a collection of uh, bamboo, different sizes of of bamboo tubes. But I would imagine you could get um, you know different sizes of maybe PVC or something along those lines too um, to arrange in a little box. The, the big thing is you want different sized holes. So maybe if you could find bamboo or something like that, you could do that as well. Um, how do you plant milkweed in the snow? You drop the seeds in the snow and kind of stomp on them a little bit and go back inside. That's it. And again, they may grow, they may not, depending on if, you know, the little animals get to them first. Um, so, you know, but that's generally how they say to do it, which is very comparable to how they would reseed themselves in nature. Um, if you have a rabbit issue and a house cat, you can get compostable wood litter and mulch with it in a ring around the plants you want to save. It helps. Thank you, Mary. Um, any ideas for getting rid of buckthorn? Pull it out, still comes back. Yes, it does. That's one of those that comes back angry. Cut the stump, treat it with triclopyr, some, some herbicide that includes triclopyr, little paintbrush, brush it right on the stump. Don't get it anywhere else. Just brush it right on the stump. That will take care of it. Just know that you may have to do this several times because the birds eat the berries and poop out the seeds. So um, just, you know, just know you may, you may be fighting it for a while. All right, let me see how we're doing. Oh man, we are at 2.30. Unfortunately, my friends, I have several more questions, but I need to get going because we have another meeting very shortly. So I thank all of you for joining me today. If I wasn't able to get to your question, send me an email. Um, again, I'm just going to say that. Send me an email. Any questions, please. I I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. I thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I, I'm really blown away by the response to this, and I hope to see you again. Uh, future webinars on Monday, we have one. Uh, let me stop my share here. There we go. Um, on Monday, we have uh, turning your neighborhood pond into habitat. And on Thursday, we have Fox River Dam. Should we, leave, should we live with them? Can we live without them? Which is going to be a good webinar regardless of where you live, even if you don't live on the Fox River. Um, it would still be very informative if you live somewhere that has dams and that are looking to be removed. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, hope to see you again very soon. and. Take care. Bye-bye.